Sorry, I'm trying to get something. Okay. And so manifest destiny going westward, this continental country. And there's a few reasons why we got to get it. The first reason why is this. That basic idea of land. Remember yeoman, independent farmers. It's still that desire. There's land out there. Not in the plains. They called the plains the Great American Desert. And the whole goal was to get across the plain to get to the Willamette Valley and then, or California. As it turned out, California didn't have a lot of rain either in a lot of it, but they thought it did. Two, slavery. Southern states were desperate to get more slave states, more slave state senators, and protect slavery. So this was becoming another form of diffusion. Spread out, there's only one else. Spread out slavery. Three, ports. We want to trade with China. The lucrative China trade was just opening up. The British and the French had defeated China in what's called the First Opium War. And we really wanted these ports for that lucrative trade to, frankly, exploit China. And last, number four, blatant nationalism. We want to spread American civilization, whatever that might mean. We're going westward, and doesn't everybody want to be American? And so when American settlers went west, when they went into Oregon, which up until 1845 was claimed by U.S., Britain, up to that time, Mexico, before that, Spain, and Russia, and not even saying the people who actually lived there, when citizens of the U.S. went here on the Oregon Trail, went to a technically undeclared country, they went as Americans. And that's a big deal. They didn't go to another place and say, I'm starting a new country. No, they went there and bringing the flag with them, an important component of Manifest Destiny. And so, that is Manifest Destiny. That's why they went west. And we're going to get, well, if you think about the west, we do teach a history of the American West class here at Capitol. Uh, we have... It's our first year. Ms. Pierce is teaching it right now. But, and I don't know who will teach it next year because, you know, things might shake up a little bit. But this will cover more detail. I frankly don't have time to go into great detail, or detail <laughs> as interesting as I find it. But the first one who went there were the mountain men. And the mountain men were, a lot of them did trapping, but most of them were traders. You know, they would just trade with American Indians. And it was, what they wanted where it's things for the carriage trade. And the carriage trade, that's what wealthy people wore when they rode their carriages around in New York City and London. And what did they wear up to the mid-1840s? Stuff made out of these things. Beaver. Beaver felt hats. So you scrape away the hard outer fur, you got this fine felt, and that was beaver skin hats were the rage. 1820s to 1840s. So they, yeah, they, mountain men did kill beaver, but the big thing is they traded with American Indians for beaver. And this went on till mid-1840s, and literally, I mean, this was shocking how fast it happened. The carriage trade just shifted, and boom, the air of the mountain men ended. Like, overnight, just boom, gone. Silk. They went to silk hats. It's over. So the carriage trade, what was that? Just like Well, wealthy people who would... In like New York City or London, what they would wear when they rode their carriages around town. Oh. Beaver skin hat. Then it went to silk, boom. Like Montana, Montana, North Dakota border had one of the most famous of the trading ports called Fort Union, right on the confluence of the Yellowstone and Missouri River. And that's the port today. They whitewashed it. The American Fur Company owned it. If anyone's ever been there or near there, why am I, I didn't mean to ask that. If you ever get a chance, go there. It's really cool. And they got reenactors inside there. It's great. Has anyone been there? Did you like it? How long ago? Um, that's uh, the summer before the next. Yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Did you go to the park, too, where they have a, the interpretive center about the confluence of the rivers? No, it was super quick. They went to a little bit more of that uh, and then the promise. Uh, and when you were there two years ago, it was still crazy with the oil boom. Yeah. I get. I mean, it's just not like over. And like everyone's just pulled out. like Or Sydney. Got huge, overwhelmed, and gone. Get a chance. If you get a chance, go. I really like it. They do a good job there. Well, that's what we get after the, that ended. Partially, kind of because of the pain, 
you get many people taking what they call overland trails. The most famous being the Oregon Trail, but also the California Cutoff. That's where the Donner Party got it right there. The Santa Fe Trail, another very famous trail. And these people are going across the Great American Desert, as they called it, and then boom, you get to here. It's very expensive. It's a nine-month trip. Incredibly brave. I mean, these are hardy, determined men because you're not riding. I mean, it's, you're walking to Oregon for nine months. I mean, think about that for a second. And riding some of these, well, let's jump the gun here. Let's get to this real quick. 250,000 people went in these 20 years. That's a lot of people. So when the United States wanted to claim Oregon and then later on say that we should, the U.S. should annex California, these are the American citizens that gave the United States credibility, a claim. You can really see how, uh, uh, why did they jump so much here? And then here, gold, yeah, gold. That is from one of those romantic artists I mentioned with the, mentioned with the transcendentalist, and I love this painting. It's supposed to be the Oregon Trail, and by people who, you know, Bearsat Ber had never been to, who had never been outside of New York City, painted this as his vision. And as we all know, Eastern uh, Wyoming looks exactly like that. It's like something you'd see in a different part of the world, like not even a few They're copying romantic art from Europe. I don't doubt it, good. Here is the Oregon Trail, and sometimes it would take about nine months, and they have little spots along the way, like Chimney Rock, uh, Fort Laramie, Independence Pass, South Independence Rock, South Pass. I mean, you had to be these certain landmarks at a, at a certain time, or you're not going to make it. So, like, if it's the end of May and you're only at Chimney Rock, you're in real trouble, real trouble. And this is the worst part of the trip: high, high mountains and virtual desert. Hard to get water. And it's going to be very expensive. Here's one of the wagons. These prairie schooners are kind of historical wagons. And if you rode it for long enough, you get the equivalent of, of seasickness. So basically, you walked. Uh, that's Chimney Rock. Does anybody want to guess why? What was it about 50 years ago? About half of it fell. That's why it's broke right there. It just found the wood it away. And this is one of my favorite spots is Independence Rock in Wyoming, where either they carved it or used axle grease to put their names. And it's pretty amazing. They just, it's, it's, they want to let people know this is what I did. I did this. And yeah, regard, you know, there's can mixed feelings about it, but what an amazing group of people. And that's one of the still there from the Oregon Trail in Wyoming. And so you got the wheel ruts, rain eroded it right there, and so there's a lot of spots where you can associate the wheel ruts from the Oregon Trail. It's it's pretty neat along Wyoming. Very similar trail, a little bit after. Oh, that is right here. Those are actually people on the Oregon Trail, but I put them in here for the Mormon Trail was very close to this, and this was the Mormon Trail was after the Mormons felt they had no choice but to flee Nahoo. Illinois. They had fled New York to Missouri, then fled there to Illinois. And the reason why is Mormons had a, had a problem with, or I'm going to rephrase that, mainstream Christianity. The Christian churches had a real problem with Mormonism. It was different. It was, as they, they thought it was like a cult, especially at the way the Mormon church was practiced at first. They don't necessarily believe in the divinity of Christ, which is the definition of Christianity. And plural marriage, uh, as they saw, this was a radically dangerous idea. So they were run out of a number of, place, number of places. But Joseph Smith in this picture here, and if you weren't sure, it's an old, old photo. If you weren't sure. If you just weren't sure. This old or not, yeah, it's old. When he announced that, or sort of created a private army announced that he was running for president, the other people in Nauvoo, Illinois, who already were infuriated with him for other reasons, based on the private army part, thought, we can't let this man be president. And it started with just ransacking his newspaper, but pretty soon it got out of control and Smith was lynched. 
or maybe she's just torturing somebody to death. Brigham Young, and this is an old cut and paste. They're not actually photographed together. You cut off the two pictures, you put them on another map, you glue it on there, you take another picture, you take that picture, and then they would airbrush it, meaning paint the edges, take another picture, and that's how you would do it. Oh, then they tried to paint the cheeks a little bit of pink to make them look lifelike, and it kind of smudged. I think that's my favorite part of the old photos. Brigham Young led them to a very close to Oregon Trail, but a little bit off because of fear of other citizens of the U.S., and that's why they went to the Great Salt Lake. This is a picture of people traveling on that trail, and whenever I look at this picture, I like it for a lot of reasons, except for it doesn't look like he has a pig leg. If you ever look at it, I think, oh, the, he lost his leg. <laughs> That'd be really tough to go across the United States like that. Here's the Mormon Trail. Oh, very close, and they chose here because it's a basin. All the water flows into that for a million years, and what happened was you have the, a massive salt lake, now it's a relative smaller salt lake, but these salt flats. And the assumption was, nobody from the U.S. is going to come here. First off, it's part of Mexico, and secondly, it's salt flats. There, were some, there was some fertile area, but that's why they chose here. He did send people that went a little tiny place called Los Angeles, just in case they had to run away again and go to some place like the Sandwich Islands or Samoa. What are the Sandwich Islands? Hawaii. That's what they call them there. Isn't that a great name? The Sandwich Islands. British. That's all I gotta say. British. <laughs> so let's get to the war for Texas independence because manifest destiny, in reality, all the arguments about it are personified by this. Because you can imagine a significant number of Americans about before becoming a continental nation, but is it going to be a slave republic? Or a republic of a market economy and capitalism. Soon they would say free labor. What system will go west? That will be the cause of the Civil War, slavery in the territories. And this is the first fight. And it would really get us the first thing about what do we do about Texas in this war for Texas independence in 1836. Actually, 35 36, but 36 is the key year. Here are a few of the Texas flags. Your death. But what happened was this. In 1821, Mexico won its independence. The problem for Mexico is, think how big Mexico is. They're trying to create a republic, and it goes from the Yucatan Peninsula all the way up to, if you look at this map, right here. All the way down is Mexico. It's huge. It was twice as big then as it is today. And there's a massive desert down here. The vast majority of Mexicans, so these are Spanish-speaking people of Mexico, you, with some kind of European descent, Spanish descent, throw it on Mexico City. They are having a hard time holding on to this. What the new Mexican government wants are as many people as they can get to say they're Mexican, Mexican citizens and move in here. Until they get that, they're worried it will fall away. Remember, the U.S. thought the same thing about, like, uh, all the way from Illinois down to Mississippi. There's another big problem here. These cities would come later. All this area here, a fierce tribe that really took to the horse when they got it from the Spanish, controlled that area and made it, well, very harrowing for any Mexican settlers to come in there. What tribe? That was a little bit further this way. Now it's right about here. Apaches are right about here. Apaches would not mess with these people. And you know the Comanches. And the Comanches were fierce. They took the horse like nobody did. There weren't that many Comanches. But wow. The story was a young Comanche man, about the time they're 20, could be able to ride. Pony at full gallop, we're talking, you know, there's no saddle, of course not. And while riding, you can flip on the side of the horse, using the horse's protection, and shoot the bow and arrow under the neck of the horse at full gallop, the accurate of that arrow at 75 yards. I mean, I could do maybe 50. <laughs> 70. I'm going to stay on the horse. 
horse. I know. Side of it. Yeah, you have to get your legs. Isn't that amazing? Hurt the horse. We're not shooting the horse. <laughs> Even though you'd be so shocked how many times that actually did happen. You know, I mean, think about it. I, do you mean like hurt the horse by hanging that way? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Horses are strong. They really, I mean, their horses are shockingly strong, so they can take it. But yeah, I know what you mean, though. Mm -hmm. They lived all, it was just a huge area. Them and their allies, the Kiowa, which is fierce. In fact, this would be the scourge of Texas until technology probably. The Colt Revolver. Yeah. What was the track called? Comanche. Comanche. They were fierce. I mean, they don't mess, they don't mess with the Comanche. But finally, they just, technology of you know, the United States. In the United States, just have the resources. They can just mm -hmm. So, are the Comanche fighting like, the U.S. people? Or? Mexicans, anybody who's not Comanche. Oh. If you're if you're not a Comanche, you're in trouble. They were, and they routed the Apache. <coughs> the only way people might have compared were maybe the Lakota, Sioux, and the Northern Plains, but I don't know if they compared to the Comanche. Well, anyways, so they needed people who were Mexicans to live here. Well, they couldn't get Mexicans to move up there, so. This is when these decisions were looking back for Mexico. Be like, oh, this is dumb. Woo! This is crazy stupid. What they did is they opened up all this land to American immigration. They encouraged citizens of the U.S. to come to Mexico. The most famous being Stephen Austin. Stephen Austin, right here, this would be his land called Austin's Land. Oops, jump the gun right here, his colony. Me U.S. citizens would come in and they would have to get, to get land, and it was good land. They'd have to say, I'm a Mexican citizen, so renounce their American citizenship and become Catholic. I am a Mexican citizen, I am Catholic, and that they thought with the church they could maintain whole. Now let's be clear about it. What do you think most citizens of the U.S. who went to Mexico, what were they thinking? It's ours. Yeah, it's ours, I'll say whatever, I'm keeping it. And then a bunch of squatters followed because they heard it was free land, and they just came and took it. Squatter means you literally sit on the land and say it's mine. That's where the term squatter comes from. And so now Mexico's having a real problem. You have all these people coming in, and they can't control them. The name of this, though, it's actually called, it's Tejas Province. And Tejanos were Mexicans who lived there, and Texans are going to be the immigrants from the U.S., Texans, Tejanos. They're all moving in, or they're moving in there. And what happened is the Mexican government fell apart over Texas. The Republic could not survive. Who became the dictator who took over Mexico? Santa Ana, you're exactly right. Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. Who to this day is still a hero in Mexico with a very complex history? There's one painting of him. I prefer him with a mustache. But Santa Ana's got to figure out a way to hold on to this because he has all these now Texans coming in who want nothing to do with the government in Mexico City, and they're a thousand miles away. So Santa Ana did two things. Number one, no more immigration. No more immigrants from the U.S. It's cut off. Period. But then, what about the Texans who are already there? They brought their slaves. So Santa Ana banned the slaves. They used to say, you must free them, you must get rid of the slaves. Because he knew the Texans had to have labor to work the cotton, the new cotton plantations in Texas, and so, and slavery, economically, they're in trouble. <coughs> they're in trouble. And banning slavery and trying to enforce that would be the trigger of the war of Texan independence. So you're going to see a lot of independence and liberty and a fight for freedom. Let's be clear about it. Yes, Santana was a dictator, but the war was fought because the Texans wanted to keep their slaves. They don't talk about that in Texas, by the way. So, with that, the Texans revolt. Sam Houston would begin the command of the Texan militia. Texas, 
They have to have a militia. Comanches and slaver belt. Sam Houston was an old protege of, of Andrew Jackson, who, when he fell on political hard times, he did like a lot of people did. He tried to test us. Very talented man. He's trying to organize because he knows Santa Anna is going to come and try to crush this rebellion without mercy. No quarter. Santa Anna is going to come up and use terror to destroy this. And we're coming up to two battles. Oh, the Lone Star Republic would be created in 1836. And these are a couple. This is its first flag. You like that one? And then this is a flag at, um, um, where's the battle? Right here at uh, a Bazaar, which is a, uh, I love to come and take it. What year is this? 1836. That's a cannon. <laughs> and it's basically saying, come on, you want our cannon, we're going to fight. Yeah, the Texans love that one. That will become the Texan flag. The Confederate flag would be modeled after this. Just add 11 stars, 10 stars. No, the Confederate flag is not the same as the Confederate battle flag. And the first battle I'll tell you real quick about is Goliath. And Goliath was right here. And then about 500 Texans tried to defend a Spanish mission there. Houston ordered them to leave, but they didn't. That is their flag. You got it. That's a pretty cool flag. It's like an arm and a sword. That the sword isn't bleeding. There's blood on the sword. No, they're not cutting. He's not cutting off his arm. <laughs> it's, yeah. Well, they basically surrender without a fight. And under Santa Anna's orders, even though he was not there, all 500 were executed. All. And that leads to the next big fight. It actually happened about the same time, but the Alamo. A 13-day siege. This is going to go down into Texan myth. This is a painting of the battle. I've just a little bit left to finish tomorrow. We do the Mexican War. We start slavery. Who's going to be gone tomorrow? Okay, so you got that gin assignment. Maybe. Yeah, I can't. You don't remember, remember half? You start with content, audience, yeah. purpose, point of view. Look over that sheet I gave you. So on Monday, we're going to come and do an assignment on that right away. Okay. Look at that. Do the zen. We'll see you. Wyoming Cowboy. Talk to Mr. Carter. Yeah, Cowboy. Can you send that to me? Yeah. Have a good day, everybody. Right when you find work. Wire. Yeah. No, I don't care. I'm just going to give you a bit. Yeah. Can you leave a phone? Yeah, my music for entire time. I'm going to sign chapter 11. Okay. And the reason I'm going to sign Friday, that's like, so I'm going to sign chapter 11. And then we're going to do a thing. Read this article and underline his defense of slavery. And then do half the lines with the one class. Okay. And the two, he's, he's an evil man. We'll find out why after we do that. And okay. Sound good? Awesome. Yeah. Where are you guys going? Uh, Great Falls. It's Great Falls. Yeah, I knew it's coming up, but I, I never know what the dates of things. I just know it's coming up. All right, you should be fine. I mean, I will film the boxes. Okay, thank we'll you. We'll see ya. Yeah, I'm um, we, I gotta change the schedule, and I totally forgot about that math competition. I don't know why people don't have the But the thing is, they're using the library, and I was gonna give you time in the library to work on your project, but yeah. I totally forgot about it.